okay guys, we're ready to finish up chapter five. So we wanna talk in this last module about the remaining two types of tissue, which of course you see here are muscle and nervous tissue. We have already discussed epithelial and connective tissues. This table, again, like several of the preceding tables in this chapter, does a good job giving you a broad overview of the major descriptions and functions and locations of both muscle and nervous tissue. So if you're looking for a quick synopsis, this would be a good table to reference. Notice that there are three types of muscle tissue and we will talk about nervous tissue in very broad terms. There are, there are a lot of different kinds that we will not differentiate um, the different uh, types of nerve cells, but you'll be hearing a lot about that in ANP2. In fact, um, your book devotes two full chapters to the nervous system, nervous one and nervous two, and then a third chapter to the special senses, which are uh, in some ways very much connected to the nervous system. So you're gonna hear a lot more about nervous tissue next semester, but we'll talk a little bit about it today. So you've seen this box many times before. I've been, uh, again, trying to uh, encourage you to learn not only how to differentiate between these different kinds of tissues, um, but also know where in the body you'd go to find them and what do they do. Same applies for muscle tissue. This first type is the most uh, abundant type of muscle tissue in your body called skeletal muscle. It gets the name skeletal because it's connected to your skeleton. So when we do the muscular system in lab in another few weeks, we'll be learning many of the major muscle groups. And so these are skeletal muscles. Maybe you've heard of names like uh, biceps brachii or rectus femoris or rectus abdominis or gastrocnemius. These are all names of different kinds of skeletal muscles in the body. And so much of what makes up your body weight, as it mentions here, about 40% or so is muscle. So it's a fairly significant type of tissue in your body, at least from a weight point of view. When we talk about muscle cells, specifically skeletal muscle cells, we also use the term fiber in place of cell. So you may hear me or you may read in the book where they talk about uh, a skeletal muscle cell. More times than not, you'll see skeletal muscle fiber. So don't let that throw you. A fiber, a muscle fiber is the same as a muscle cell. And unlike many cells that we've looked at in the past two sections here of chapter five, these particular muscle fibers, be it skeletal or smooth or cardiac, tend to be very elongated cells, as you can see from the artist's sketch here, where we have upwards of uh, what 15 or so skeletal muscle fibers. Notice how long they are. Now they have a cell membrane um, it's called a sarcolemma, and don't worry about learning that. We'll be getting into this in the muscular chapter uh, in a couple, couple weeks from now. But like any cell, we have a cell membrane or plasma membrane. We have a nucleus, and you can see those, of course, shown here in blue on the artist's sketch. And in this uh, stained section of about seven or eight muscle fibers, we can see these dark purple structures. These are the nuclei. And what's really cool and different about skeletal muscle fibers is the fact that they are multinucleated. Now we've always said up to this point in time that a typical cell has a single nucleus and most of your cells in your body do. But here's an exception to the rule where skeletal muscle fibers or cells are multinucleated and they lie just underneath the cell membrane on the very surface here of the fiber. There are also other organelles here. There are mitochondria, lysosomes, 
smooth and rough endoplasmic reticula and so forth. Um, but what makes up the bulk of a skeletal muscle fiber are special types of contractile proteins called actin and myosin. And again, we'll talk more about those coming up in a later chapter. But if you look close again at the sketch or actually the histologic section, you see these little bitty lines, um, these striations. And that's where um, the term striated muscle that is sometimes used in some of the older textbooks comes from. So if you ever read about striated muscle, it's the same as skeletal muscle. And these dark and light and dark and light striations come from the, um, the arrangement and the overlap of these actin and myosin filaments. And that's all I'm gonna say right now. We'll talk more about them in great detail coming up I think in chapter uh, nine is, this, is the muscular system. So very elongated, they have striations, they're multinucleated, they make up the majority of muscle in our body, contributing 40% of our body weight. And the other thing to keep in mind about skeletal muscle is that it is voluntary. You have conscious control over your skeletal muscle. You can write notes, you can look up, you can um, run, walk, swim, jog, this all involves nervous uh, interaction with this type of tissue causing contraction. So contraction cannot occur unless an impulse travels down a nerve that terminates in a muscle or muscle cells. And in response to that, muscle fibers can contract. And when you look at a muscle here, for example, of the sartorius, this kind of elongated muscle that I'm pointing to with the, uh, with the arrow, or, or any of these muscles of the upper thigh, you have literally tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of these individual fibers within a larger, broader muscle that we call the biceps branchi or uh, the sartorius or whatever it might be. So again, this is microscopic. You can see it's magnified 400 times. So we're at the limits of our dry objectives uh, in order to see these uh, skeletal muscle cells or fibers. Smooth muscle, how does it differ from skeletal? Well, there's a number of different attributes that this type of uh, tissue has, fibers. First of all, if we look at the artist's sketch, we see that like skeletal muscle fibers, smooth muscle fibers are very elongated, right? Only here we have a single nucleus per fiber. Not many like we had with the skeletal muscle fibers. In smooth muscle cells or fibers, one nucleus. And then the other thing that we often find when we look at a smooth muscle cell or fiber is the fact that it's sort of pointed at its ends. So we often use the term spindle shaped. So it's kind of pointy at one end, pointy at the other end, kind of thick in the middle. That's just often a, a very common a morphologic uh, characteristic of smooth muscle fibers. Smooth muscle, unlike skeletal, is involuntary. You cannot consciously, voluntarily control the contraction of smooth muscle. So if one thinks about where one would go in the body to find it, i.e. the digestive system here, right? Stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and so forth. When you look at the entire digestive system or GI tract, there is a layer called the muscular layer. There can actually be more than one muscular layer. But this muscle that we find in the GI tract is smooth muscle. And what the muscle in our digestive system acts to do um, is um, mix and churn the food, like in the stomach. And then when the time comes for this watery chyme to be squirted into the small intestine, um, a process called peristalsis takes place. Actually, it, it takes place even in the stomach. But peristalsis is defined as uh, the rhythmic, unconscious contraction of smooth muscle. And in this case, it helps to propel the food, basically from the time you swallow it and it enters the esophagus to the time the unabsorbable waste products uh, exit the rectum, really. So there's smooth muscle at work all throughout the entire digestive system. Another place you can find smooth muscle is lining blood vessels. 
So if you think, for example, of an artery or a vein, like the digestive tract, an artery and a vein will have a layer of smooth muscle. And if you think a little bit about the fact that if the smooth muscle is oriented around the circumference of the artery, we call it circular smooth muscle. If this is the lumen of the artery, okay, the blood is passing through that space, what happens if my fingers represent circular smooth muscle and this smooth muscle contracts, the fibers contract? Look what happens to the lumen. It gets smaller, doesn't it? And what's that gonna do to the blood pressure? Well, it's gonna cause it to go up. Now, if I relax this smooth muscle in the wall of the vein or artery, the lumen gets larger, what would that do in terms of the blood pressure? Well, it would lower it, yeah. So contraction and relaxation of smooth muscle lining major blood vessels like arteries and veins can have a big impact on increasing or decreasing blood pressure. And all of this is regulated by our autonomic nervous system, which again, you're going to hear more about next semester, but you have no conscious control over that. It's all on automatic. So you can think, kind of think of autonomic is automatic. And oftentimes, um, smooth muscle can, uh, can respond in a particular way to the nerves that are, are stimulated by this particular branch of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. Um, the uh, iris of your eye has circular smooth muscle in it. What happens when you go from a dark theater out the door into the parking lot and it's very bright middle of the day? Your pupils constrict, don't they, in response to the bright light. That's due to contraction of smooth muscle in your iris in the colored part of your eye. When you go into the movie theater and your eyes get accustomed to the darkness, they of course dilate. Now it's not dilate, it's dilate, dilate. They get larger and that's due to relaxation of smooth muscle in the iris of the eye. Again, you don't think about it. You just respond to it, don't you? When you walk into that bright parking lot or walk into the dark theater, your eyes automatically adjust. And our last type of muscle tissue, cardiac. Well, if you don't know where this is, you're in big trouble. Uh, obviously, it's the heart. It's the only place you find cardiac muscle fibers. Okay, how do they differ morphologically, shape-wise, to smooth and skeletal muscle fibers? Well, there's a, a commonality with smooth in that there is one nucleus per fiber, and this is also involuntary, like smooth muscle is. However, you might notice that there's branches here of these skeletal muscle fibers. So we sometimes refer to it as being uh, bifurcated or branching. So you don't have this, this bifurcation in smooth muscle or skeletal muscle. Um, another thing, if we look super close, is we can see that there are these lines, like striations, right? That's borne out also in the uh, uh, compound light microscope. If you look really, really close, it's kind of hard to see here, uh, but there are little bitty light stained lines. These again are the actin and amylosin filaments that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but be careful, don't confuse cardiac with skeletal. Cardiac muscle is involuntary, skeletal muscle is voluntary. Cardiac muscles found only in the heart, skeletal muscle found connected to the bones, um, and cardiac again being bifurcated in their morphology, the fibers, while the skeletal muscle fibers tend to be kind of long, elongated rods. I do want to point out a structure right here though, and there's one here, and there's one here, and there's one here, there's a whole bunch of them if you know where to look. These are called intercalated discs on the stained histologic section of, of many cardiac muscle fibers. You can see these intercalated discs. They're darker striations, aren't they? Not to be confused with the very, very light 
uh, ones here that are tough to see on this particular photograph. But here's a dark one. Here's one. You can, you can see them here. There's a lot of intercalated discs. And these intercalated discs are basically where one cardiac muscle fiber comes into contact with an adjacent cardiac muscle fiber. So let's pretend that my hand here, the tips of my fingers, denote the end of one uh, cardiac muscle fiber and the uh, fingers of my other hand would denote the end of an adjacent cardiac muscle fiber. So where they come together, where my fingertips touch, that would form an intercalated disc. And it's across these discs that ions can flow very rapidly to ensure that when this entire mass of cardiac muscle contracts, it contracts together in what's sometimes called a syncytium. It's kind of a funny word, syncytium. Because you don't want a part of your left ventricle contracting while another part relaxes or doesn't contract. You want that entire left ventricle wall to contract together. And so the presence of these intercalated discs, um, these specialized intracellular junctions is really what they are, ensures that this entire mass of cardiac muscle uh, contracts all together if it's going to contract. Okay, and then to basically wrap up, wrap up this section of chapter five, um, nervous tissue, as I said earlier, there's a lot of different kinds of nervous uh, tissue cells. Um, we're gonna just mention a couple, maybe just one major type. You know that the nervous system is basically the brain, the spinal cord, and the various nerves that emanate to and from the brain and spinal cord. We sometimes call this the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. And so when one looks at the cells that make up the brain, the spinal cord, the majority of them are referred to as neurons. Neurons. There are different kinds of neurons. Again, more on that next semester. Um, they aren't the only type of nerve cell, but we're gonna talk about them because they're the most common. And when we talk about a neuron, generally this nerve cell, I'm gonna show you, I'll show you a picture of it in just a moment, um, has one end that contain what are called dendrites. It's, it, they're parts of the fiber, parts of the, uh, of the cell, I should say. And these dendrites are going to basically transmit impulses into the cell. While the axon segment of the cell is going to continue to transmit and convey, convey, uh, convey that impulse um, to perhaps other adjacent neurons, or if that neuron um, terminates, let's say on a skeletal muscle fiber, the, if, if the nerve impulse comes down and is strong enough, it may cause the effector, which is the muscle fiber, to contract. Um, or maybe if that particular neuron terminates on a gland, like the salivary glands, the effector is the salivary gland. In response to the impulse traveling to it, it might release saliva, right? So, if you think back to our discussion of homeostasis and the role that receptors, the control center, and the effectors play, how does the control center get information from the receptor? Well, it's through nervous tissue. It's through neurons transmitting those impulses. How does the effector get impacted or stimulated by the control center, which is usually the brain, not always, but we'll, we'll say it is for now for our example. Well, it's a result of nerve impulses traveling from the brain again to the muscle, let's say, or the gland. In response, the, the muscle contracts or the gland secretes its product. So here's a sketch and um, a stained tissue section um, of a neuron. So kind of a funny looking structure, but 
we have these dendrites here. They're not obviously labeled in the diagram, but, but let's pretend uh, they are labeled. You can label them. These are the dendrites. They um, are going to convey the impulse toward what's called the cell body. The cell body is this kind of large dilated region. And no notice, of course, a large nucleus here. And there's other organelles in there as well. And then often, depending upon the type of, of neuron, there would be an axon that would extend from that cell body and then terminate perhaps on an effector, like we said a moment ago, a muscle fiber. Or if there is an adjacent neuron, there could be dendrites here that come in close proximity to the tips of the axons. And that impulse may then be transmitted to the next neuron, in which case the impulse continues on its merry way. So we'll be talking more about transmission, how that occurs coming up again next semester. Um, in this uh, stained smear, it's really what it is, we see the large cell body. You can see the nucleus. You can even see what's called the nucleolus here, this dark purple structure in the very, very center of the larger nucleus. This would be the cytoplasm, which actually would extend um, into these uh, dendritic regions as well as into the axon. So the, the cytoplasm isn't just cell body. It can extend into the dendrites and into the, uh, the axon. But basically, you can kind of see these pink extensions. These are likely dendrites that are, again, bringing the impulse toward the cell body, and then it would be, it would be uh, transmitted along, uh, typically a, a long neuron, or a long uh, cell body, excuse me. Um, so this is sort of a generic neuron. They're, they come in all uh, different states, uh, sizes, and, and there's different kinds. But uh, just for now, know that these muscle cells called neurons are functioning in transmission of impulses. Okay, well that wraps up chapter five.